Um, so I'm going to do a really quick primer about the law and encryption. I think there's a lot of bad information going around about this topic, even by legal scholars. Does anyone read the Washington Post vocal conspiracy? Um, there was an article by, ooh, they're the worst. There was an article by Orrin Kerr. Um, maybe I didn't do this right. Okay, there, right. there we go. Um, there was an article by Orrin Kerr, and I actually uh, ended up emailing him and being like, no, uh, this is not the way it's supposed to be interpreted. And uh, a friend of mine, Jonathan Mayer, uh, texted with him, and I guess he wrote a follow-up post uh, fixing kind of his, his thoughts on it. So um, I'm going to do a lot of primer about Fifth Amendment law, kind of what's going on with encryption. Um, but generally, how many people here are following the encryption backdoor debate? Okay? Um, everyone's invested. There's a big reason why the debate is going on right now. The legal system doesn't really know how to handle encryption. So really quick before I get into all of this, uh, I have to do this. Um, I'm not your lawyer. This presentation is not legal advice. Um, so I cannot give you legal advice. If you'd like legal counsel, we can talk about that. Um, but generally a little bit more about me. Um, I'm an attorney, but I'm a master's student in computer science at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign, focusing in computer security and digital forensics. Uh, generally, uh, I figured it would be good to have some technical background before I give you guys all legal advice one day. So this is my favorite quote about encryption, and it comes from a judge. Uh, encryption is an altogether different beast, and I think this is an absolutely amazing quote that cap encapsulates kind of the problems going on with encryption um, and the law and how the legal system handles it. So this class that I'm holding for you guys could also be called Applying Very Old Fifth Amendment Law to New Technology. Um, and so what we're going to talk about here is the Fifth Amendment. So you guys know the Bill of Rights. Um, this one is uh, the one you could, you know, your right to not incriminate yourself, etc. cetera. Um, and so kind of here, uh, this is when you refuse to do something the government wants you to do, and they try to make you to do it. Make you do it. That's kind of where this uh, right comes in. So, how how do we get to this point with encryption cases? And unlike a lot of the other presentations, I'm gonna have a lot of slides. I figured sometimes with legal issues, I find just seeing the text is a lot more helpful um, than just hearing about it um, because the words are very technical in the sense that each word has a value and a meaning. Um, so encryption cases, most of the police already possess the data or could possess the device containing the encrypted data. Uh, they cannot read it and they ask for a password or a decrypted version of the data. So that means the, the, the government in some capacity already has legal access. They've been granted some capacity through Fourth Amendment law or through um, an exception to Fourth Amendment law that they have access to. Um, a device that has encrypted data on it. So what then happens is they'll force an arrestee to make to reveal an encryption key and this might trigger the right against self-incrimination. And so I'm going to talk about kind of what's happening here. Um, the interesting thing about this privilege is there's no warrant exception. So imagine you're the government, the, the courts have allowed you to gain access to a device and you can't get it. And there's no exception to allow you to get it. So of course you're going to panic, and this kind of triggers why that uh, we want a backdoor uh, voice is coming in from the police, is that the legal system doesn't allow for a proper balance like it traditionally has with encryption. And so um, the Fifth Amendment generally says no person shall be compelled in any case to be a witness against himself or herself. Uh, and so kind of what does that mean? That's just one sentence in the in the Fifth Amendment in the Bill of Rights. Um, you know, how do we how do the courts interpret this? And so you've heard about the Fifth Amendment right against incrimination. You probably hear, I plead the fifth on counsel's advice. Um, and then you hear this right to remain silent, which is a Miranda right, which you know they arrest you and they say you have a right to remain silent, anything you say can be used against you, et cetera, et cetera. Now this right is a little bit different than Miranda right, and I'm saying this just because. Um, it makes a really um, important distinction here. One is that, and I'll touch upon it later in my presentation, you can invoke your Fifth Amendment right to self to not incriminate yourself at any time for any reason. And so I'm gonna stress that again and again. 
Um, but the Miranda right makes it seem like it's something you can only assert after you're arrested or only if you're already in trouble. Um, so like, how do we get to this point? And I'm going to go back to the recent case that's been in the Washington Post. The SEC is investigating two individuals for insider trading. They had company phones. The company policy was that each individual employee put a passcode on their phone and the company did not collect it. So the, company, the two employees who are suspected of insider trading were fired. The, they turned in their devices and the SEC came knocking and said, give me the devices. So the company is more than willing to comply, but they don't have those individual passcodes. And they did that for their own security reasons. And there's nothing to say that that company's policy was good or bad, but it was simply a decision that they made. Now the government's going to say, we really wish you would keep the passcodes for your employees, but I think for a lot of other great reasons, it's, it's a good policy to have. So they turned over the pass, the phones to the SEC, and the SEC tried to unlock them and were unable to. So they filed a court order asking for the passcodes to the devices from the two individuals, and they refused. And the court ultimately sided with the two individuals, saying that their Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination applied here. And so, one, it's important to see that this, this protects an individual, not a company. The company could not have assert, asserted those rights for its employees. Only the individual themselves can actually invoke this right. Um, and it has to be through their own testimony or personal records, um, and it has to be compulsory. So we'll go, I'll break it down, but generally it can be asserted any proceeding, any time, for any reason, investigatory, adjudicatory, oh my god, the words, they're hard to say today, um, administrative, etc. but any time. I just want to stress that again because I think there's a lot of misconceptions that you have to be in trouble or you have to be suspected of something to invoke this right. So for the privilege, there must be compulsion, somebody must be compelling you, self-incrimination, and there must be a testimonial communication or act. And these are the three main components that the court is going to look at in deciding whether or not your Fifth Amendment privilege applies. So I'm going to break them down one by one. <laughs> Compulsion. This means court order or grand jury. That's it. Not a police officer. It has to be the court telling the individual you must give this up. So a police officer can come up to you and say, tell, tell me your password. You must tell me your password. You do not have, that is not compulsion at that point. The court has to say it or a grand jury must require you to do so. Self-incriminating. So this means supports a conviction, provides a link in the chain of evidence that might lead to incriminating evidence. And I disagree with a uh, wonderful scholar, Orna Kerr, again, on this issue. And this means anything that might lead to incriminating evidence. And that's pretty broadly interpreted by the courts. It doesn't have to be, you don't have to be guilty to invoke the privilege, and it doesn't even necessarily have to lead to guilty testimony, but might make it a little bit more probable that you become a suspect, that someone cares about what you were saying or cares about um, the next link in the chain of evidence. So if, you, if it makes your life more difficult, I think the courts would even still side, on, side with you and say, well, yeah, because anything you say could generally make you a suspect or they could hassle you. And so you just have this broad right to just not talk. So it protects the innocent as well as the guilty. And this is, I throw out quotes from the courts because it's really important to see. This is the Supreme Court of the United States saying, you know, this isn't just a protection for guilty people, it's a protection for innocent people as well. Um, and they're ensnared by ambiguous circumstances. So this is like a great thing that the courts already realized because how many people have had significant others who maybe aren't in security that say, well, if I encrypt it, it look like I'm hiding something, right? So um, the courts at least realize that you know creating protections for yourself doesn't make you look guilty. Um, and finally, this self-incriminating statement can be one that just increases the danger. Again, this is accused, charged, or prosecuted, um, and that's the statement might just make you look like you might be accused. So also, it doesn't have to be for the particular crime they're asking you about. If they're questioning you about insider trading, but you know you have other criminal aspects on your phone, you can absolutely remind, you know, it doesn't have to be involving a particular crime. Um, it's, you don't even have to have anything on your phone. 
So testimony, what does this mean? Well, this is where it really gets tricky um, and where a lot of people get wrong. Oral statements, turning over your password, your passcode, your passphrase is an oral statement. It's testimony, it's coming from your mind, it is something that exists only in your mind. Um, actions are a little bit more difficult. This means turning over decrypted data or entering a password without revealing the password to the person required, asking for it. So I say this and I, and I stress this, that revealing the contents of your mind and doing something like turning over decrypted <coughs> documents do not go through the same legal analysis. It's two completely different legal analyses here because it's the way the, the court is uh, handling where the information is coming from. One is an action and the other is purely from your mind. So the courts have said that defendant's statements as to their password is testimonial. So that's going back saying, yes, it's coming from your mind, it's protected by the Fifth Amendment, you know, but it's unclear now is what's gonna happen if they say turn over decrypted data because that's not revealing necessarily anything in the contents of your mind. So I'm gonna briefly touch upon quickly Providing blood samples, fingerprints, voice samples, etc., not testimonial. So the police can take your thumb and force you to put your thumb on your iPhone. They can decrypt your phone that way. So you know it's you have to be conscious of that. Um, where the re act revealing the contents of your mind arises in document production, um, they can compel a merely physical act. So what about turning over documents? And what does turning over documents actually reveal? And so here it's that the documents exist, that they're authentic, and that they're in the individual's possession of control. So by turning over and decrypting documents, these are the types of things that it reveals. And so you are protected and you can invoke your Fifth Amendment right to self-incrimination if by decrypting you, one, prove the documents exist, or two, that they're authentic, and three, that you possess them. Um, and so the problem in this particular analysis is that the act of production doctrine is insanely fact specific. I mean, I wish I could say like, here are the cases where you'll be successful, here are the cases where you won't, but it's just not going to work that way because each judge is going to interpret it differently. It's a very big gray area. But if the court can show with reasonable particularity that when it sought production, that they already knew the guard, like, the materials existed, then it's a foregone conclusion, and you don't have that protection anymore. And so this, this happens in a series of cases. There's one in particular. A man was crossing over the border. They opened up his computer. It wasn't encrypted, or it was uh, just sleeping, and it didn't have like a passcode on it. And they, they flipped through, and they saw some child pornography. They shut it down. The computer was encrypted, and they asked for the key, and they said, and the guy says, no, I have a Fifth Amendment right. I don't need to give this up. And what unfortunately happened is the court says, no, this is a foregone conclusion. We already know those documents exist. We already know they're in your possession, like four come up. And he had to decrypt. Um, you can technically still refuse. You're just going to sit in jail for um, contempt of court. Um, and, and, and there have been some who've done that. Um, if they gather an information in another way, then they don't have that, or if they grant immunity. So it's not testimonial because it's no longer incriminating. And this way, um, you know, you're not really incriminating yourself if you reveal it. So other things is other evidence, um, bypassing security, brute force, or a back door. This is great, like if they have a back door, they don't have to go through the legal process of getting this information. So again, like I touched upon these things before, but it's generally that they possess the documents, they were in their possession, et cetera, and that the act of turning that over is gonna reveal that. Um, and I'm, I have a lot of slides in here about this because I just wanna stress it, that these are the broad things that um, they are going to look to prove in another way so that VA can say that it's already a foregone conclusion and therefore you have to turn over a decrypted version. Now, if the court order is asking for you to reveal your password, absolutely that's the contents of your mind, and that could also be used for other things. They could try those, that password on other accounts, they could try it on other devices, et cetera, because now they have that information. So the Fifth Amendment privilege is much stronger when it comes to the passcode or passphrase, but for acting, or if a court order asks for decrypted versions of documents, 
that, that is really where we're going to see the active production doctrine and the foregone conclusion come in. So the good news is, is that this is pretty settled law in the sense that the active production doctrine um, and the Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination is pretty settled. It could change at any moment. I mean, there could be a Supreme Court case this year, and it could just upset everything because that's how common law works. But um, as far as with encryption, it's kind of just figuring out how it fits in with the current system. Um, so, you know, why doesn't this happen in every case? Um, it really is the other investigatory work that the that the government is doing in that case, or how the case has gone down. Now, if you say, yeah, that's my phone, and yeah, it has images of you know child pornography on it, now you've given up that right because you've spoken, to, you, you can't assert then that you can't turn over decrypted versions because you've already stated that some type of document might exist on that phone. So only a few courts have examined this. Where they really differ is the foregone conclusion, and it really depends on um, you know, what kind of stuff is revealed when you are turning it over. Um, courts differ here. Some say the fact that you possess the device, that even if it's found on your person, maybe it's your friends. Like, you have it for that moment, but you may not know that passcode. Um, and so they have a little bit higher burden of proof for the government to actually prove the foregone conclusion elements. Um, and then finally, and I'm reiterating myself, but I'm running close out of time, these are roughly a, a brief spattering of the cases that have touched upon it. Um, and, I, and I like to reference them because if every time I read a news article that doesn't have like the site as a lawyer, it drives me nuts because I can't then go read the original document. Um, so I like to you know, collect a list. Um, but the, the government independently proved in this case here that he was the sole user and possessor of the computer. That was it. Because they were independently able to prove that, um, they decided it was a foregone conclusion and they forced him to turn over the documents. Um, and I use this map um, as kind of an illustrative example of how many people haven't talked about this issue. Despite it being a very heavy debate um, in DC right now and amongst the security community and the government, and it's particularly the FBI, um, very few courts have really addressed this issue and they don't all agree. Um, so, you know, the courts also struggle, and this is just an interesting technical thing, is whether or not actually having an encrypted computer says that those files exist. Some really great courts um, in particular have said just because it's encrypted doesn't mean that there's any information on the computer at all. And other courts have said, well, if it's encrypted, that means there must be something on it. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, my thoughts are encrypt, 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 assert your right, you can assert it at any time, use a strong passphrase, and avoid biometric authentication because that is going to bypass your legal rights where you normally would have had them. Thank you. <laughs>